Amen. Well, we have officially entered into the Christmas season. Is anybody excited about it? We got a couple. <laughs> this is officially the time where people can, you cannot be rightfully judged for listening to Christmas music too soon or having your Christmas tree up too early. You're right in the right spot. And now this is normally also the time where we as a church will focus um, a lot more on the coming of Christ to the world that did in fact change everything. And if you don't believe me that it changed everything, just think of the fact that Jesus is the most known historical figure of all time. Or how about the fact that we base our calendar year around his coming to the planet? We live in the year 2020 because we're roughly 2020 years away from when Christ came to the earth. So he's kind of a big deal. And today, I don't necessarily want to focus just on how he came, but rather on why he came. And to do that, I'm going to do it a little bit differently, and I'm not going to focus as much on his first moments, but rather his first miracle, which I believe shows us the entire reason why he was born in the manger in the first place. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in John chapter 2 this morning, John chapter 2. But to set the scene... Around 700 B.C., 700 years before Christ came, the prophet Isaiah, he prophesied to the people of Israel, and he said this. He said, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow and aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all people, the veil that is spread over all nations, and he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And now 700 years after the prophet Isaiah prophesied this, we see a great feast going on in the land of Cana a very hilly and mountainous region in the land of Israel. And there's a feast going on because there's a wedding. Now, I know today weddings are still normally a big deal, and a common wedding nowadays from preparations till the end can take an entire day. However, back then, the wedding festivities normally lasted five to seven days. A wedding reception nowadays is normally three to four hours. Theirs would have taken three to four days. And in the height of the celebration, a problem arises. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, she goes to the one she believes to have the solution, that is her son. And I believe this account tells us what Jesus has come to do, why he comes to do it, and how he comes to do it. So if you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me in John chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Where John writes, on the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. His mother said to his servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Canaan, Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Would you pray with me one more time? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you so much for coming to this planet and truly changing everything. Thank you that this building and this group of people would not be gathered together right now if you did not first come to the planet. And thank you so much for coming to die, to give us joy, to take away our shame, and give us new life. 
And Father, I pray that in these moments that you would speak through me, Father. I know I can't say anything of any significance or importance without your power of your Holy Spirit, your truth, and your love behind each and every word. And Father, I pray that you um, would be all with all of us in this room. I pray all the distractions and stress of life would cease. We focus on you and your goodness and your glory and your love. Thank you for being here. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for who we get to be in you. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We love you. It's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, last year, um, we were having our first college lunch of the new semester. Chandler Young, our incredible college pastor, was not here yet, so it still fell on my shoulders. And... We were having this college lunch, the first one of the semester, and we had a great turnout. We had spent the past couple weeks um, uh, doing outreach around campus and, and seeing a, a bunch of people, and then we had over 200 college students come through this service for the college lunch. And everything seemed to be going great, and uh, from my end, everything was fine. And I think I just finished preaching the 11 name service that day. And so I know that Cassie and all of her amazing volunteers, they got it covered over there. So I'm hanging out and talking and whatnot. And whenever I finally make my way over to the student center, I still see there's a lot of students in line waiting for food. It's great. I'm saying hey to everybody I can. But then I see Cassie. And if you don't know Cassie, our serving hospitality coordinator, you're going to get to know her a little bit in the way she is today. Because I see everybody, everything looks like it's going great. And I look at Cassie, and she's got this look in her eye. And she starts making a beeline towards me. And while she's walking towards me, I'm trying to think through all the things I possibly could have done to make her look at me like she wants to stab me in the throat. Right? And then when she gets up to me, I'm looking to make sure she doesn't have any sharp objects in her hands. And she goes, we're running out of food. I said, okay, all right, well, how much do we have left? And she looks at me like I just called her mom a name or something. She's like, not enough. I said, all right, okay, all right, it's going to be okay. Here, you can take my card, send someone to Little Caesars, pick up some hot and ready's. And she just snatches the card out of my hand and goes, nobody likes Little Caesars. And she run, walk, storms off. And she reluctantly sent someone to go get some hot and ready's. Now, if we take the time to think about the culture and the context Cassie is in at this time, we can better understand her reaction and her state of mind in this moment. Because we're in the South, and if we're honest, the real life of any party in the South is what? It's the food, right. And so you can, and the company's second, right? You can have bad company at a party, you don't like the people around, but if the food is great, it's still going to be a good party. I can't tell you how many weddings I've been at where the most talked about aspect of that wedding was the food. Just last week, me and Rachel, we were at a wedding. And it was a great wedding. It's surrounded by great people. We had a great time. It was fun. But when we got back to her parents' house, they asked us how it went. The first thing we talked about was the food. And I officiated it. (laughs) But the food was incredible. And And it's not enough to just have food there. It has to be good food, too. That's why Cassie, she wanted all the homemade casseroles from all the amazing people in our church for the college students to experience, not a $5 hot and ready from Little Caesars. No offense to Little Caesars, but because you could have great companies surrounded by great people, but if the food is bad, this is probably going to be a forgettable social event. So if you're hosting a party and you have all this great food around, and you see the food starting to dwindle down, and there's still a lot of people who haven't gotten any food yet, your, your heart is going to drop a little bit, and you're probably going to start to panic. Because if the food runs out, the party runs out. And so you have to keep the food coming so the party keeps going. Now, why is it that the first sign that Jesus performs to show his glory and who he is to disciples is essentially a party trick to keep the party going. This is a valid question because if you look at anyone who's running for any sort of public position or public office, their first public statement that they make to announce who they are and what they stand for is so thoroughly thought through and vetted so their message will be clear. And Jesus and John, the writer of this gospel, they're doing the same thing here. In verse 11, John is clear in saying that this story, what Jesus did at this wedding is a manifestation of his glory, who he is and what he's come to do. Therefore, 
the setting here has to be very intentional because the atmosphere in which Jesus first reveals this is in itself a statement of why he has come. Now, if you're a non-cynical person, what's the number one emotion you're going to associate with a wedding? It's joy. A wedding is supposed to be a celebration. It's a celebration of love. It's a celebration of hope. It's a celebration of two people going on a new journey of new life together. It's supposed to be a joyous celebration. And the writer wants to make it abundantly clear that our first point today, Jesus has come to bring joy. Now, sadly, I'm not sure how well this has been depicted to a lot of people. And it's amazing how many stories I'll hear of people who've grown up in church and have since stopped going. And the number one reason they give is they say, oh, I just want to enjoy life now. But one of the quintessential reasons that Jesus came to the planet is to enable us to enjoy life to the fullest. And God has been intentional throughout all of scripture of wanting to relate a life with him to one of celebration, a life of festive joy. Throughout the Old Testament, God refers to himself over and over again as the bridegroom and the people are his bride. And in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is asked one day why his disciples won't fast, and he answers this way. In Matthew 9, he says, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Translation, are the groomsmen going to be depressed and anxious when they're with the groom, or are they going to celebrate with him? Jesus is saying, I am the bridegroom. And anyone who would have grown up in Jewish culture and had an understanding of the Old Testament would know that Jesus is making himself equal to God and claiming his deity with that statement. Also, in the very next chapter of our passage today, in John chapter 3, John the Baptist is confronted with those who are telling him, hey, all these people used to follow you, but now they're going after this Jesus guy. What are you going to do? And look at his response. He says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. John says, no, 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 no. This is a cause for joy and celebration because the groom has arrived and the party has begun. And you know who the most annoying people at weddings are? They're the ones who just complain about marriage the whole time. There's these guys, that they just crack these passive-aggressive jokes constantly going on and on about how you're going to lose your freedom. You're stuck now, buddy. It's not too late to get out. Ha, 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 shut up. Nobody wants to hear it. Because there's those that they don't like how their marriage is going, so they try to project that onto the new marriage and put a damper on the celebration. And the root of it comes from them focusing on themselves. And if you want a recipe of how to lose joy in your life, Make everything about you. And I wonder if we have too many Christians that have put a damper on the celebration that a life with Christ is supposed to be because we're too focused on ourselves. Think about it. What's the basis of the celebration of a wedding? It's celebrating the love and the union of a bride and the groom. And as soon as we shift our focus to, away to anything other than that, you will lose out on the joy of the celebration. In the same way, the basis of the celebration of the Christian life is found in people coming to know the love of Christ and uniting to their Savior. And too many believers will lose out on the joy of the Christian life because we'll shift our focus away from that. We'll focus more on the way we think things are supposed to be done. Or we shift our focus with arguing with those who don't believe exactly the same way we believe. Or we'll scrutinize every little detail of each other's lives when we're supposed to be focusing on doing everything we can to see people come to Christ, come to the bridegroom as we did and celebrate that. That's what Jesus is getting at in Luke 15 when he said, I say to you, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 persons who need no repentance. And Jesus wants that same joy that's felt in heaven to be felt among us. And we can obtain that joy if we can focus more on the bridegroom and celebrating those who come to him. Celebrating those who have gone from death to life in Christ. Celebrating those who have had their entire eternity changed in the love and the acceptance of God. This is why I'm so convinced that church should be a celebration every single week. I've literally heard people say, 
You know, I hear people talk about how they enjoyed the service today. I'm sick of hearing that. You're not here to enjoy it. You're here to worship. I would disagree with that statement. I would go as far as to say that if you're not enjoying it, you're probably not worshiping. That's why the Bible says taste and see that he is good, not just believe and know. He's intentional about incorporating these sensory emotions into worship because God doesn't want robots. He wants a loving, joyous relationship. And he's proven over and over again in scripture that he wants this relationship with you not to be just like a king to a subject or a shepherd to sheep, not even a father to his children. But he wants to relate this. He wants the ultimate loving relationship, so intimate, so full of joy, that he compares it to a bride and a groom on their wedding day. Isn't that so relieving? Because how often do we spend time thinking about the way that God sees us? You know, I'm two days away from my one-year wedding anniversary now, and I got married a little bit later than most of the people I went to college with because if you go to a Christian college, the social norm is that you are engaged at least by your senior year and you are married shortly after or right after you graduate. If you live on a Christian campus, the term ring by spring is a reality. And so my first few years out of college, my early to mid-20s, I went to a lot of weddings and people that I went to college with. And then finally, when I was getting out of that cycle, I then met Rachel uh, a couple of weeks before she graduated from Gardner-Webb. And then we got together, she graduated, and then we got to enter into that wedding cycle all over again with all of her college friends. And now at this point, I've had the honor and the privilege of also officiating a number of weddings now. So it's safe to say that in my short 30 years, I have been to a lot of weddings. And I've noticed that there's a trend among the people who attend weddings nowadays, especially among the female side, that whenever the bride comes in and everybody stands and turns, they don't want to watch the bride come down the aisle. What do they want to watch? The groom. They want to see the way the groom sees the bride. So it's a little bit awkward every time you're standing there up front, whether you're the groom or the officiant, and you're standing up there and you want to focus on the bride coming down the aisle, and you have all these people turn over here and breaking their necks to stare down the groom. But you know what? I have never seen a groom disappointed. I've never seen anyone who's seen a groom be disappointed. And no matter what the bride looks like on a normal basis, whenever she's done up in her bridal attire, has on that white dress, she is stunning in an entirely new way that no one's seen before. And in that same way, you can be confident that no matter what you look like on the inside or out, no matter what you have done, where you have come from, or whatever your past has held, Jesus wants you to know that once you come to him, God sees you the same way a groom sees his bride. And you might ask, how could that be possible? You could be thinking about your own life, all the hidden habits, knowing that God sees absolutely everything about you, the entire timeline. How could God look at me the same way a groom looks at his bride on the wedding day? And I believe that answer is found in this story as well and in our second point, which is Jesus has come to cover shame. Now, it's safe to say that once Mary finds out that there's no wine left at this party, she goes into a bit of a panic mode. Now, it might not be Cassie-level panic mode, but it's still a panic mode nonetheless. Because this party is nowhere near being over. And you can kind of compare it to if you're at a wedding and they're catering the dinner and half the guests go through and they get served their food and they realize that they're out of food and there's still another 50 to 100 people left without. You can imagine how embarrassing that would be. Now, in our culture, we'll get over it and move on. It might even turn into a funny story down the line. However, we don't really understand what it means to live in an honor-shame culture because we live in a very individualistic society where it's me against the world. You know, the basis of the American dream is to make something of yourself. But in an honor-shame culture, it's completely family-based. And if you live honorably, you honor your whole entire extended family. But if you mess up, then your entire extended family is shamed. And that label of shame can hang over you and your family for generations. 
I remember when I was a teenager and I got in trouble at the, uh, one of the military bases that we were stationed at. And my dad had to go and stand before the disciplinary board for that base and answer for my mistake. And what made it worse was that my dad was normally one of the guys sitting on that disciplinary board that people would stand in front of, and now he has to answer to them. And you could see how bad they all felt for him because they knew how embarrassing it was. So you can imagine the guilt that I felt in that moment and the embarrassment that my dad was experiencing. Now, in an honor-shame culture, that sort of guilt and embarrassment could come from something that we would seem trivial, that that would seem trivial to us, like running out of wine at a wedding, especially since weddings were the biggest social event of their lives. The entire town would have been a part of it. Now, they wouldn't necessarily like scoff and mock them when they see them walking down the street the next day, spit at them, call them names. Not really in that kind of uh, shame, but it was more like a pity. It's more like every time you see him, oh, that poor thing. You just feel bad for him all the time. When you see him, you kind of cringe a little bit. It's like, ugh. That pity a lot of times can be a lot worse than the scoffing. And that would have been what, what that is what would have happened to this family if word would have gotten out that they ran out of wine at the wedding. It would have been so awkward. Everyone would have gotten real quiet. Everybody would have cringed. They would have slowly made their way out. And that guilty feeling, that label of shame would not have just affected the bride and groom, but each of their families as well, even to the aunts and the uncles and the cousins. Also, everyone who worked on the wedding would have their reputations and their careers ruined. People's very livelihoods were on the line here. Also, just to add on top of it, the Jewish people were also very superstitious people. And in Jewish culture, according to the Old Testament, wine was a symbol of God's blessings, a symbol of joy, happiness, abundance, and new beginnings. Therefore, if the wine ran out, it could have been seen as a sign that God was not blessing this marriage. So Mary, she sees everything that's at stake here, and she takes the problem straight to Jesus. Now, why Jesus? He's not in charge of anything. He's just a guest. It's not his problem. But Mary knows exactly who he is, and she knows his heart. And she knows his heart is to cover shame. She had spent the past 30 years studying and getting to know the heart of Jesus. And if you look at the beginning of the book of Luke, and you see her interactions with the angels and the shepherds and the wise men and finding Jesus teaching in the temple, what does Luke say that she did? He says that she treasured up all these things in her heart. She knows him better than anyone else on the planet does at this point. And she knows how much he cares, which is why she doesn't even flinch at his response. And his response at first seems a little bit harsh. He says in verse four, Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hours not yet come. Now, first off, I would like to clarify, I do not encourage any man to go home and address your mother or your wife in this manner. However, whenever Jesus says woman, he's not being disrespectful here. Remember, this is a different culture. We actually see Jesus address Mary the same way whenever he's on the cross. One of the last things he ever says before he dies, he's standing there on the cross. He looks down, he sees Mary and John at his feet, and he says, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. Then John took care of Mary from that day forward. Jesus was making sure she was being taken care of. So Jesus, when he says woman, he's not being disrespectful. However, his response at first glance still seems like the typical single person at a wedding. What does that have to do with me? It's not my wedding. It's not my time yet. (laughs) We've all seen this guy or this girl who's at a wedding, and they can't enjoy themselves because they're so preoccupied with their own singleness. Now, Jesus would not have been to this extreme, but what does a single person think about whenever they're at another wedding? They're thinking about their future wedding and what it's gonna take in order to get there. Now, Jesus, in a sense, could have been doing the same thing here. Now, stay with me. I promise I'm not being heretical. He would have been looking forward to a wedding, but not in the sense that you and I would. He would have been looking forward to a wedding that John describes towards the end of the book of Revelation that Pastor Skip talked about last week when he wrote in Revelation 21, then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Now, Jesus could be sitting here at this wedding thinking about what it's going to take to make that wedding possible. And it won't be possible without him covering the problem of sin and the shame that sin has clouded mankind with, which is ultimately the reason why he came. And when Jesus says, my hour has not yet come, he isn't saying, I'm not ready to start doing miracles yet. Because every time Jesus refers to his hour, he's referring to his death. So essentially, Jesus is saying, woman, what does this have to do with me? I'm not ready to die yet. Which seems like a pretty dark statement to stay at a wedding. But Jesus' death was always before him. He always knew it was coming. He knew it was the reason why he came because he knew it was the way he would cover our shame. I listened to Dr. Tim Keller speak on this, and he explained it this way. He said, Jesus came primarily to die, not primarily to live. If Jesus came primarily to live, he would merely be an example. Therefore, we would find our way to God by trying to live like Jesus. But if Jesus came primarily to die, he doesn't come as an example. He comes primarily as a savior. If he came merely as an example, he would be like any other founder of any other religion, teaching this is the way to God. But Jesus says, I'm God, come to find you. And because he has come as our God and our Savior, he comes to bring joy. And he gives us this unending joy by covering our shame with his blood. And in doing so, our last point today, Jesus has come to replace the system. You know, every human being in our broken state develops a system in how we think we're supposed to live in order to have a successful life. And if we choose to be religious, we'll develop a system in how we believe we should live in order to obtain or maintain favor of the higher power we choose to worship. And even those of us who choose to worship Yahweh, the one true God, we can still find ourselves in this endless struggle of trying to appease God on our own behalf. However, like I said two weeks ago when I was here, the only thing that pleases God is his son. That's why it's impossible to please God without faith because it's impossible to please God without Jesus. And Colossians says, once we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are then hidden in Christ, which means Christ completely covers us. He covers our shame. He covers our guilt. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sins and our faults and our failures. He sees the perfection and the sacrifice of his son. Therefore, everything that we are and everything that we do should be centered around him. He sets the precedent for everything that's done in and through our lives. And now Mary, who knows this better than anybody else does at this point, she takes the problem straight to Jesus. And he seemingly dismisses her. But I love her response so much because she doesn't even acknowledge his answer. She doesn't even address him directly for the arrest of the account. She just turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. What we need to understand is, is that there's never a problem that is either too big or too small for Jesus. That's why Peter tells us to cast all our cares on him because he cares for us. I've heard it said that there is no problem outside of his detailed care. However, once we take the problem to him, we need to leave it in his hands. Because how often will we take a problem to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, here's my problem, and here's how you need to fix it, as if we're giving him directions on how to be God. But Mary understood that he cares too much to leave the problem alone, but she was wise enough to leave the solution up to him. And like he normally does, he gives a solution but not before a very confusing process. And the way that he does it in this specific instance shows us that he has come to replace the systems of life that we set up. You see, the Jews, they had their purification systems for almost any public event because they understood what every human being deeply understands, and that is that there is something wrong with us. Every human being deeply understands, if we're truly honest with ourselves, that were flawed in some way. And the Jews, they lived in this constant tension of the known holiness of God and their own known flaws. 
So they couldn't just simply walk into any event, especially any that had any religious connotation. They knew something had to be done to cover their flaws. So at an event such as a wedding, they would have these stone jars that they would set up with what they call purifying water in which they would physically wash their hands and in doing so, they would symbolically be washing themselves spiritually. So it's no coincidence that Jesus tells them to take these jars that were set up for their system of purification and turns their purifying waters into wine. And now I'm not gonna get into the debate of whether or not this wine was alcoholic or the percentage of alcohol that would have been in this wine because it's simply not the point. The point is that Jesus took a hopeless and a shameful situation and he turned this water into wine which was the symbol of God's blessings. And further than that, whenever Jesus is at the Last Supper with his disciples, what does he compare the wine to? Anybody? his blood. It's as if Jesus is saying, this system that you have for purifying yourselves is being done away with because the only thing that can purify you is my blood. You cannot come to Jesus and still operate the same way that you always have. He brings about a new reality, a new system of life. If you remember back when we talked about how Jesus was asked why his disciples won't fast, He answered in Matthew 9, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? He goes on to say, nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. See, the wineskins that Jesus is referring to is the system of life that we have in place. And we can't just simply add Jesus to our system. He gives us an entirely new system. He gives us a new way of life. And so many people can't understand or get the most out of the Christian life because we try to simply add Jesus to our lives. But Jesus cannot be added. Like Pastor J.D. Greer likes to say a lot, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He doesn't want to merely add to your joy. He wants to give you a completely new joy. He wants to give you a new mind and a new perspective. He wants to give you a new heart, a completely new life, free from shame and full of joy. And because of what he has done on the cross and the hope that he gives us, no matter what life throws at us or how difficult things get, this joy is always available to us. He gives us the opportunity to choose joy in any circumstance because like Paul says in Romans chapter eight, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And the way that we stand and live in this joy is shown in the way this scene finishes up as well because they they draw some of the new wine out of the water jars They take it over to the master of the feast, which would have been like the the wedding coordinator, the DJ, the hype man, all wrapped in one. And then he tastes it. And then he makes this big scene telling everybody how awesome the groom is for providing this incredible wine. But the groom had nothing to do with it. I'm reading this and I'm thinking, no, give credit where credit is due. These people are supposed to stand up and tell everybody what Jesus did, right? But when you think about it, this is exactly how we come into a new life with Jesus. We're completely empty. We have nothing to offer. We've tried our old system for too long. Nothing works. And then we come to Jesus, and he does all of the work, and he fills us to the brim. And we get to reap all the benefits. It's not fair. We may not be able to fully wrap our minds around it on this side of eternity, but to put it simply, it's called grace. And it's available to all of us. And Dr. Tim Keller, he goes on to describe this scene of this joyous party continuing on after the new wine had been passed around. The people not knowing that the very wine they're sipping on represents the death of the one who made this joy possible. And Jesus sits there at the party with a smile on his face. And Dr. Keller describes, 
He sat in the joy, sipping the coming sorrow, so that we could sit in the sorrow, sipping the coming joy. You know, no matter how sorrowful life may get, we get to endure it with joy because we know it'll only last for a moment. And because Jesus endured the sorrow of the cross and he rose from the grave conquering death, we have an eternal joy available to us that no form of worldly suffering can ever take away. We have the opportunity to live in this unending joy because of what Jesus did on that cross. And we no longer have to live under the dark cloud of shame that our sin has brought upon us. We don't have to live in fear of death because our eternity is secured. And no matter what hardship this world may throw at us, we know that when all things are fulfilled, we'll be celebrating at that great wedding John described in Revelation and that great feast that Isaiah described in his prophecy. And we will all say on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And you know, we don't have to wait until we get to heaven when that great marriage supper of the Lamb happens. We don't have to wait to experience that joy because we get that joy right now. We get to enter into that life right now. And you can get the most out of this life if we can keep focused on what's most important. We keep focusing on doing everything we can to see people come into this life to experience this grace that we have experienced. Why we get caught up in all the details and all these mundane arguments and disagreements when people are dying every day, eternally separated from a God who loves them more than they could ever fathom. And we get to experience that love and we take it for granted whenever we try to keep it to ourselves. Whenever we try to focus on what we're getting out of this love, what we're getting out of this relationship. Every single wedding that I officiate, I always make sure I tell every bride and groom, focus more on what you're giving to this relationship rather than what you're getting. And the more that you're focused on the other person, the more the relationship can grow and be blessed by God. The same is true for our walk with Christ right now. Man, if we could have a group of Christians that could get over ourselves, if we could get over trying to focus on what we're getting out of it, what God's doing for me and focus more on who we can bring into the kingdom with us, I tell you, you will live the happiest life you could ever possibly live on this planet. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much that we get the opportunity to enter in to this kingdom. And Father, I pray over every single one of my brothers and sisters in this room, Father, I pray over all of our minds that you would give us a deeper understanding of perspective of the kingdom of God that we get to walk in right now. Father, I pray you would give us a burning passion for the lost. I pray you would truly break our heart for what breaks yours. Father, we know that you are not willing that any should perish, but all should come into repentance. And I pray you would give us that drive and that motivation Father, to make the most of the life we have here on this planet, bringing as many people into the kingdom of God with us as possible. Oh, Father, I pray that Hope Community Church would truly be an army attacking the darkness. Thank you so much that you've given us your light. Thank you so much for giving us this joy. Thank you so much for covering our shame. And thank you so much for giving us a completely new life and a new system. So, Father, I pray the Holy Spirit that every single believer in Christ carries, I pray you would stir that spirit up within us, Father, and you would use us for your glory on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for who we get to be in you. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We love you. And all God's people said, amen. Would you stand and worship with us one more time?